Um, my name is Wynne Schwartow, and I've been a security guy since roughly 1983, doing security awareness work, beginning with information warfare, back in roughly 89, 90, and then transitioning into various odd other fields, uh, portions of awareness and training. This is Clarence Chow, a brilliant, brilliant AI guy who we met in Paris three years ago. And we got into a big fight and a lot of beers <laughs> and talking about uh, AI stuff because he is an expert on AI. And yeah. That was, was that your master's? Yeah, so I did my bachelor's and master's at Stanford in AI, and uh, I grew up on Wynn's talks. He <laughs> literally has been giving talks my entire life. Um, and, and I think uh, when, when I met him, then uh, he really has a, a novel way of thinking about the problem and his latest book, Analog Network Security, kind of... Crash pitch, <laughs> buy my book, BOGO, RSAC code, Analog Network Security. <laughs> We're going to be referring to that because in the last uh, three, four years of research and work I've been doing, we've come to some conclusions about the nature of security, some of which actually manifest themselves when we talk about AI. Uh, Clarence has a book as well, which is amazing, Machine Learning and Security. And it is a Bible, as far as I'm concerned. It got me really starting to understand AI, both from the framework standpoint, but down at the deep technical level. Many things you're going to hear today you're not going to like. How many AI vendors are in the room? <laughs> All right, you want to leave now, sir? <laughs> uh, you're going to hear some things that may not be particularly popular from my view, uh, from Clarence's view. And we're going to take slightly different approaches to bring you up to speed on how we view AI, ML, DL, whatever term you want to use as part of where this industry is going and what you're seeing downstairs. Uh, I'm not going to read all these things for you, but this is what we're going to be covering and we're going to go through it fairly quickly to keep it at the meta level as much as possible to get you to be thinking about the philosophical and theoretical basises by which you may want to embrace AI or may want to unembrace AI. Uh, some of the things that we're going to be talking about uh, is, does AI work? Does AI actually work? And that question does not have a binary answer. It is definitely a mm, yes, sort of, maybe, sometimes in some applications, but not everywhere. Don't believe every vendor. No offense to the vendor in the rear. Uh, AI. Is AI racist? The answer, unfortunately, as we can prove, is yes. And the racism is not only about people of color or culture, it's about the racism of data, as he will get into, because we can look at data as a racist function or a cultural function as well. Fundamental truths that I'm going to begin with, that I believe. AI is not absolute. Anybody that tells you it is, run like hell. We are not in the AI world in a deterministic frame. It is 100% probabilistic. Uh, does everybody understand the difference? Deterministic, yes or no answers. Probabilistic, somewhere in between, which therefore analog security. It's somewhere in between a zero and a one. There is nothing that's absolute. Uh, if you hire a CISO, would you hire a CISO who says, I am great at what I do. I'm going to give you the answers that you need but I'm not going to tell you how I get them, how I arrived at those conclusions, and they may be wrong. <laughs> that is AI. Have fun with some vendors downstairs, because this is absolutely true by any good data scientist in the world. We don't know how these things come to be, how they arrive at the answers. And for those of us that have grown up in the digital world, keep in mind, AI has no memory. There is no memory in AI. Now I'm going to show you an example of this. This is Nashville. And there's a picture of it. And that's a picture. This is when Deep Thought came out. And we were all starting to mess around with it before I knew anything. And I met this gentleman to say, now you're wrong. You've got to learn all this stuff. And it creates some interpretations which are clearly fuzzy. Not good, not bad, but certainly not the original. My wife hates this one. 
So this was just a simple picture of her, <coughs> excuse me, that I ran through deep thought. On the right, I ran it through deep thought 10 minutes later. The same image went in. Which one is correct? When your AI gives you an answer, which one is correct? I love this gentleman's answer. Go, eh, I don't know. That's right. None of us really know. And this was over a period of 10 minutes where the AI engine picked out particular features and decided to use those as a stronger, heavily, more heavily weighted variable. And this is where we begin to get into the concept of bias, because it is a constant variable. Clarence. Now, when people talk about algorithms and how to use data science in their, in their work and field, I think a lot of emphasis is placed on what methods you use to get to the results, on how you actually do the learning, on, on, on what kind of statistics you're using. But I think what people tend to, tend to oversee, tend to overlook, is the fact that the data is actually much more important than any, any of the algorithms that you can use, any of the systems that you can use. And so there's this whole online craze called Edges to Cats, which came out a couple of years ago, when people, uh, when some researchers found uh, a, a way to generate pictures of cats using uh, pictures of cats uh, based on edges that were drawn by a human hand. And then uh, there's all sorts of crazy things that that form from this. And I think the the crux of of, of what uh, we're trying to do here is that to prove a point that the data behind an algorithms. Uh, the, the data behind an algorithm is much more important than the actual algorithm being used to make the prediction. And so when I, when I first wrote this book uh, a year ago, um, I went to a conference in Germany and someone asked me why the animal was a snake. And then they, he asked, is it because everything is snake oil? And I was like, I didn't choose the animal, but that makes so much sense right now. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, I think whenever you walk along the expo floors and you look at and we, we look at vendors selling you AI algorithms, selling you ML products, you got to ask them what the source of data is, what kinds of uh, methodology they're using to collect their data, their samples in order to train the algorithms. Because whatever goes into whatever goes into these algorithms will affect the output and the predictions a lot more than the quality of the algorithms themselves. So data is everything in machine learning, in data science, and statistical learning, because it, it, it dictates the trajectory of learning. Whenever you or I uh, experience new things in the world, we're learning constantly, and we're training our own internal statistical algorithms to recognize objects, to recognize scenarios. And, and machines and algorithms are, are no different. Data collection and procurement processes dictate the quality of data that go into these algorithms and, and dictate the experience that you create when you're training algorithms, when you're training machines to make predictions for a specific task. And so most attempts by implementers to detect any kind of bias tend to, be, tend to fall flat on their face because bias is inherently hard to detect. So as we'll see with various examples as we go on in this presentation, you'll see that bias detection is something that people have spent so much time on, not only in, in technology, not only in security, but also in various other fields of empirical science because whenever you run an experiment, you're basing it on a sample set that you draw from a population. And how you draw that sample set is rarely analyzed in any kind of scientific experiment. You're always looking at the experiment itself Whereas external effects like what kind of data you use to run the experiment run, play, can play as much or even more a factor in the results of the experiment. Undetected bias, of course, can have so many catastrophic effects in the training of an algorithm. And thus, when you're evaluating, when, when you're evaluating if a product or an algorithm is suitable for your needs or not, you should not only be looking at the algorithm, but looking at whether your environment that you have in-house is suitable for running such an algorithm. And when you're evaluating results that people have put in front of you for anything that they're trying to sell you, anything that they're trying to propose to you, you should think about whether the results can be reproduced reliably in-house or not. And so the goal of the entire presentation today is that we want to come up with a framework for thinking about bias. We want to come up with a framework of thinking about what sources of truth there are in the world that you can use to base your decision factors around how you can evaluate the effectiveness of AI, of ML algorithms and systems. So there are a few different types of biases. Actually, there are a lot of different types of biases that people have classified over the years. And I think we'll go over three today. 
The first is selection bias. I think this is probably the most well-known type of bias that, that, um, that, that, that people have been talking about. When, when you train a machine learning algorithm for a specific task, most of the time you have to come up with some kind of data set, right? In supervised learning tasks, just to, just a show of hands, how many people know the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning here in the room? Okay, I think most people most people have an idea. Machine learning is is, is kind of becoming mainstream now. It's 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 a so just just for a high level overview, supervised learning is a technique of statistical learning, which uses labels that are provided to the algorithm for classification or regression, and so this means that if you have a if you have a trough of malicious executables and non-malicious ex executables, then the labels are whether an executable is malicious or not. They're feeding all of these executables into a classifier algorithm, and then this algorithm will be trained based on the labels that you give it, whether uh, it will be trained to predict if an executable is malicious or not. And it's very similar to you as a kid learning that an orange is an orange and an apple is an apple by how it looks and how it smells and an algorithm learns in the same way. Unsupervised algorithms use a different technique of learning based on the factors and parameters that you feed it that help it to interpret what an image means in terms of pixels, what a, what a piece of music means in terms of the temporal characteristics of sound, and how you can train an algorithm to classify and cluster different characteristics and parameters of these two samples differently or similarly. And so in selection bias, you're talking about how you can select pieces of data from the general population of all possible executables, all possible pieces of data in, this, in the world. And then you're selecting pieces of this data to train your algorithm with. Now, if you were able to come up with a data selection mechanism that was able to take in all possible executables in the world, every single permutation in the world of an executable and use everything to train your algorithm, then you wouldn't have selection bias because you would not need to select any samples from your population. The entire sample is your sam the entire population is your sample. There's no need to select. But the truth is that this is never possible, right? If, uh, it, because of the fact that you can never have complete knowledge and you can never have complete ground truth, there will always be selection bias. You will always need to select a subset of the population to train your algorithms. And the way that you select this subset will affect your results pretty catastrophically in some, in, in some ways. And so this is just an example of how in certain clinical trials, clinical studies, selection bias have seen to produce vastly, vastly swaying the, the results of a clinical trial, of, of a drug trial, because of how the sample population was selected. Misclassification bias or observational bias is kind of the opposite end of that spectrum. When you run an experiment, you need to define the parameters of the experiment clearly. And so what you're, what, what you're seeing in, in, in many of these machine learning uh, results in the security space is that um, they claim a 99% accuracy, zero false positives in many of these systems that they built. But what does false positive and true positive really mean in the context of things? As Wynn as, as Win brought up many times before, I think security and anything in the world really is never, is never absolute. Everything is probabilistic. Everything is, everything is indeterminate. And so when you're talking about the false positive and true positive rate, you're always talking about a threshold by which something passes or does not pass in order to be classified A or B. And so that threshold is defined in a fluid manner, and thus observational bias is, is, observational bias is also probabilistic because of how you can define and shift that threshold over time. And so as long as you set the threshold low enough, if you set the bar low enough, then you can always have a 0% false positive rate. And that's how people play with the numbers and play with statistics to make their numbers look good and, and, and to claim that they have a better false positive rate. The last type of bias is, is a more nuanced kind. It's confounding bias, where you have an algorithm that's trained on something that a human thinks it's being trained on, but it's actually not doing what you think it's doing. So the famous example that I keep bringing up that actually isn't true, this, this is it's not a true story at all, I found out, but um, it still illustrates the point. In the 80s, uh, there was a story that the DOD got a bunch of universities and academics to write algorithms to classify pictures of tanks and planes. And the main thing was that they wanted to be able to come up with some kind of image classification algorithm to classify different types of objects that a vehicle in the military field would be seeing. 
And so you'll be able to just classify something, some moving object as either a ground moving object or a air moving object. And so they got a bunch of images together and then they trained an algorithm that was able to recognize planes from tanks with 100% accuracy, with zero false positive rates. And then after a while, people realized that, hey, something's not right because when you put a tank against a blue background, then it would say that it's a plane. And so <laughs> what's actually going on? Like people can probably guess is that most pictures of planes are in the air. And uh, when you train an algorithm to recognize a plane, then it's actually not being trained on features of the plane or the image itself. It's being trained on the general background, which tends to make up a pretty significant part of the image. And thus, when you change the parameters, when you change the environment in which an image is being recognized, then naturally the tank would be recognized wrongly as a plane if you put it against a blue background. And so this is confounding bias because there is a lot of nuance around the objectives of training an algorithm whenever you think about what you're actually training the algorithm on. When you feed an algorithm or a system images of something, you would expect, the, you would expect any human to be able to tell the, the you be expect any human to be able to tell what the subject of the image is, but this is not to be assumed in many, in many different algorithms where they see images as just rows of pixels. And so whenever we think about how humans think and how it differs from, from, from how machines or systems or algorithms or programs think, we always have to make assumptions based on ground principles of what is, what is making up this image or sample. Win. All right, now we're going to add some more fun to this. And then ultimately, Clarence is going to be showing you some uh, absolute case examples. When we're building AI, we're, we're building it into cars and all the, what I call anthrokinetic cyber systems, where we have humans, we have physical objects, and then cyber objects. And now we're trying to glue them all together and make them secure. How's that going for us? Well, this, cars are obviously the easiest example to work with right now. So let's go trolleyological conundrum. Everybody's familiar with fundamental trolley problem? Yes? Okay, in this case, you have a decision, so we're going to take a vote. Right now, that train is going to kill five people. You have the choice to consciously say, I'm not going to kill five people, I'm not going to allow five people to be killed. I will choose to kill one. How many of you would pull the switch? I, I, I hear the rumbles, and that is the, how many of you would let all five die? And the rest of you, 95% of you, have no clue <laughs> because it's reality it is ethics and do we want to let ai do ethics when a room full of you 95 percent have no clue what the right answer is do we want to leave the decisions to them at all now Asimov's first law of robotics says a robot an ai intelligent system shall not harm a human or allow a human to be harmed by inactivity. What does the trolley problem do to that? Sends it into an infinite loop, a paradox that makes Einstein's time paradox look solvable. This means that we get no answer whatsoever from an AI system if we're going to be using Isimov's first law of robotics. And this is actually the Kobayashi Maru question and somehow we have to figure out how to cheat around it. Or do you say, I'm going to do neither, but there's this fat guy. He's going to have a heart attack tomorrow. Shut up. I, I, I've earned this. <laughs> do you push him off because he's going to die anyway in order to save everybody else? How many people say, yeah, I'm going to push the fat guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, and here's the perfect answer. I don't want to be there. I don't want to have to make that decision, yet we're designing anthrokinetic cyber systems that are going to have to be making these decisions. So is there a zero-sum game? Absolutely not, because we don't, as humans, know how to even ethically make these choices. So now, in the anthrocyberkinetic world, make a choice. I want the woman to die or the man to die. How many people want the woman to die? I know that's really a bad question to ask in Me Too land, isn't it? <laughs> Just saying. This is a legitimate question. When we assign the levels of context and data interpretation in order to be able to say, yes, it is a woman, yes, it is a man, now what the do I do? We don't know. All right? The black guy or the white guy? 
Oh, what happens now? I don't want to hear about it on my report. This is legitimate stuff when different people are choosing which data sets by which to make decisions and put them into something that hopefully has meaningful context. All right, five kids or the 80, which one do you choose? Yet we want Tesla and Google to put that into cars. Are you gonna buy an automatic car, sir? I don't think so. Are you gonna turn off a Lexus at home from now on? You wouldn't have a Lexus, there's the right answer. <laughs> All right, in other cultures, in this particular case where we have the caste system. So therefore, I have an AI car company. Are the AI ethical rules the same in California, New York, so the South, Europe, Asia, India, Saudi Arabia, or do I have 50 different AI engines that all have to be independently tuned to the ethical questions of the culture into which I am selling the technology. Does anybody have an answer for this? Does the AI vendor want to say anything? Oh, <laughs> hell no, you ought to see his head. <laughs> but this is what we're facing. It's a matter of well, who do you trust? What do you trust? And as Clarence is pointing out, it is data independent, and in order to get context you have to have layer upon layer upon layer upon layer and up to thousands of layers of interpretations and then give them an appropriate weighting factor. This question actually goes back to Babbage. Garbage in, garbage out. We're in the same place 150 years later when AI companies and vendors are saying, we're using AI. What does that even mean? I know I don't know. I don't know if he knows and we could fight about it, but somebody threw an algorithm at something and they said, we used a lot of data. Analyze, if you don't know what the data is, you have no clue what the answer is gonna be. So pray, Mr. Chow. I'm gonna hand it over to you now. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. That actually makes me think of, you know, there, there's lots of different societies that are using AI in different contexts. Um, I have lots of friends in China, and as, as all of you may have heard, China uses AI and image recognition in, in pretty weird ways these days, in very real ways. So um, when someone crosses the street or jaywalks, uh, you immediately get a notification on your mobile phone through WeChat saying that you got a fine, and if you happen to have some balance in there, it gets deducted automatically. So. What, what, what actually dictates what is ethical and what is not? Uh, Wynn actually challenged me uh, in a very public context on that pre previously. And, and I think the, the answer is, is, is really nuanced, right? Because when you're thinking about how you're going to build a system as a programmer with all the responsibility of the world in your hands to design a system that is unbiased, and I'm not even confident that I, as a person, am unbiased in, in, in many ways. And how can you trust humans to actually make these decisions, to define what is ethical, what is unethical, what is non-biased, what is biased in a society, and then to make systems that propagate these effects across the entire population of people? I think that's a, that's a big question for, to, to, we have to ask ourselves before we allow this concept to seep into our lives even more. And I think, the concept of bias shifting over time and how that has created a, 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 a type of system that really changes constantly that we have to deal with to, to, um, to kind of take, it, take into effect the time-based aspect of what bias is and how systems are accurate and in inaccurate over time. We all expect a given input to give us a correct output. When we're in this world, that rule disappears. Yeah, and whatever algorithm that you, that you build today that, is, that has zero false positives, because humans react because, the, because of entropy, because of the way that different systems work and environments change, you can never expect the same results for the same given system tomorrow, even in the same environment. And so the goal is really to be able to build systems that take into effect the shifting nature of environment and biases and population and samples over time, and then to somehow encode them into such systems 
And we all have no answers for this. The important thing is to think about how these effects can change your consequences of putting systems in critical contexts, in security, in healthcare, in transportation, in, in, in the judicial system, and then be able to think about how we can start to mitigate some of the, these effects as time goes on. In this case, what we're looking at is taking the analog concept of security that I've been working on for actually 19 years, and please buy the book, end of press, commercial <laughs> pitch, is a damping factor, and this comes from analog audio and electrical engineering. The goal in my belief right now, and I know that I'm not gonna be developing this, uh, Clarence and his folks maybe, is you want to minimize your maximum swing in your pendulum swing. Uh, we can look at it as po politics, the political swing from blue, red, left, right, whatever. And to minimize it more for an accurate, hopefully centrist approach, which then would, should be more representative of the data set if the data set is done correctly. Which means that your data set change is going to have to be updating itself and it's gonna also have to have a degree of self checking self-management via a feedback loop versus just saying, here's my data, there's the algorithm, and you're good for two years because that's all going to be accurate forever. So we're looking at a damping function to, function to be able to minimize the degree of the swing in the bias to approach more and accurate neutrality. Uh, very simple and abstraction, you want to be able to dial your bias controls. Is that dialing a manual process? Maybe. Is it an additional data over time process? Maybe. This is where Clarence will be talking about where the research in this whole area is going. On the left, we've got what a traditional neural network representation would show. And these layers could be thousands of layers deep in order to do complex accuracy. Uh, when you look at some of the uh, facial recognition systems that are out there now, they're doing epic fail in many cases because the data set was based upon white folk. Well, how well does that work on people of color, people of other ethnicities? It doesn't. It shows complete total bias. The differentiation between male and female, we don't know how to do it yet. The data, the answers coming out are wrong and we're trying to use these as accurate representations in order to enhance, in many cases, our, our security. Oops, sorry. And on the lower right, it's taking that same approach and applying the mathematics of analog network security to the same functions that'll be able to give us the output variable, the amount of pendulum swing away from the neutrality that we hope to achieve and we are aiming for. So bias in data sets, looking for neutrality, we really want to be able to come up with some kind of framework to evaluate if the things that we're building have bias in them or the things that we're looking to buy have bias in them, right? Because most of the time when we're looking at how to build such systems, we're never building statistical learning systems from scratch. We're always using some kind of core components, some kind of, some kind of, of, of building blocks in order to build such systems. When you're looking for any kind of human input necessary, then what we have to do would be to interview people to, in a way that, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't cause any kind of bias to come out when we're collecting this data set. When we're looking for research studies, we need to look for neutral, neutral components, neutral blocks that can make up this entire population, the sample that, that you're building, in order to not have to deal with the effects of bias that will propagate and escalate later on. And then, of course, different kinds of bias that humans have internally, whether it's racial, whether it's ethical, any kind of differences that we internally partition and classify the, the objects and, and the people that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis will be reflected in, in the algorithms that we build. And whether this is subversive or, or, or whether it's conscious, we always have to take note of how we can quantify this in a way that enables us to measure it and then minimize it. So this is something interesting that, that, that we actually tried about half an hour ago. Uh, the, I did this slide um, several months ago and just plugged in Jews should. That was what Google gave me. So I think 
Then today, <laughs> yeah, to, to, today, today we tried the same thing. We tried various different different combinations of phrases that might might result in uh, off offensive or in politically wrong suggestions, and and we saw that they've all been blocked out. You know, as long as you have any kind of action phrase in there, should or if you have any kind of sensitive group in there, then they will just not give predictions. So they have reduced the pendulum swing from offensiveness by modifying their data set algorithms with additional weighting factors for those terms that are generally considered offensive. We still found some offensive <laughs> stuff, of course, but it was less than what I found six months ago. So this is ongoing work. Yeah, and, and this is pretty amazing. I think if not for the negative press that this brought to Google or any other search engine or any other predictive engine out there, I don't think this would have, like, this for sure doesn't give a lot of commercial benefit. But because of the negative press, because of a lot of, a lot of uh, groups that, that are against um, you know, these search engines that are supposedly neutral and learning from the collective information sharing, collective uh, pieces of, of text entered in, into, into this ubiquitous box. I think they have to do something about it. Um, and so I think this is a good example of how large-scale learning systems are trying to self-correct, trying to reduce the pendulum swing uh, amplitude. Yeah, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty interesting. I, I think you know, everything that we deal with today in, in the self-driving car space especially, um, I, I have friends working in that space and then the, the trolley problem is, is a real thing that they have to deal with and, 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 and whether, you know, what kind of action should you take when you're faced with two, two paths of collision? Do you, stop in, do you stop in your tracks? And then the question is like, what happens if there's a school bus full of kids behind you? Do you stop in your tracks? And I think the, the, the inaction is, is never the answer in these scenarios. And, and all the action results in, in, in wrong consequences. And inaction is a decision. <laughs> yeah. So I think this is, this is a tough problem. But we all have to collectively try to come up with a framework for thinking about this problem. You got to get into your uh, time. You better get, your, oh, yeah. get okay. to your examples. So. <laughs> What is AI? I think, I think uh, we'll get through this slide pretty quickly. AI is a pretty general term uh, that, that refers to any kind of synthetically created intelligence, any kind of synthetically created program that can make uh, decisions or predictions or classifications of what a human would consider smart. And so when you're looking at AI as a black box, I think um, a lot of the time, you, you imagine a human in that box making a decision just like you or I make decisions. But a lot of the time, it's, it, it's not explainable. Most algorithms out there, the truth is that most machine learning algorithms are not explainable. Even when there's explainable machine learning algorithms, what they're doing behind the scenes is, is they're trying to expose their decision-making factors. When you, when you understand decision trees and how they make decisions, and decision trees are one of the most famously explainable kind of ML models. When you look at how a decision tree makes decisions and you try to analyze each branch that a node takes to the next layer, you can say it's explainable, but it doesn't really give you a, a view into how those branches were created in the first place and why uh, an algorithm makes the, made that decision in the first place. And so poisoning data sets is another big piece of, of, of the puzzle that no one has really started looking at yet. There's a huge burgeoning field called adversarial machine learning that is starting to do a lot of early research on, on this. But the question that's especially relevant in the security context is that even if you could eliminate all kinds of, of, of subliminal bias in your data sets that you're creating to train these algorithms, can you protect yourself and can you protect algorithms against the effects of malicious actors trying to poison online learning systems with, data, with pieces of data that they intentionally put into place to throw them off? And I think this is something that a lot of people are starting to realize that it's, it's surprisingly easy to do so. Because if you have a system, let's say, that takes in input from a vast population of people, and then suddenly you had one actor who was able to DDoS a system and feed in a whole bunch of bad input, then he can very easily throw the learning objectives off and then make it seem that even though you're taking all this vast input, if 30% of the input came from one person which has a bad objective, then um, the algorithm will not be learning the right thing. So unintentional bias, confirmation bias, availability, execution override, all, all of these pieces of, of, of bias are subliminal and uh, they're unintentional. 
And so if you can think about how you, how you can reduce this and, and, and how you can measure it, then you can take that out of, out of the equation and, and then you can just deal with malicious actors just like we're dealing with uh, hackers and, and, and bad actors in, in the security sphere today. Bias in data sets, uh, well-balanced data sets are scarce. Whenever you're talking to data scientists who are training algorithms, who are training systems to perform a certain task, most of the time they don't have resources to collect these data sets themselves. They have to get these data sets from various sources online, from various sources academically, and these data sets don't often come with collection methodologies or, or various other pieces of information about why, why this, this data came from only one part of the world and not the other, why it only came from predominantly one race and not another. This, is, this famously caused a lot, of, a lot of problems when you're dealing with facial recognition algorithms, when you're dealing with speech recognition algorithms, and can be caused by a vast number of different kinds of biases and effects when you have missing pieces of data in your, when you have mi missing columns in your data, how do you, how do you impute this, this data and, and how do you deal with missing columns and, and, and empty cells? So we'll look at the first case study, which is really uh, one part of two arms of different types of biases, unintentional bias. So, Closed box education is a, is a huge problem in, in any kind of statistical learning system. When you think about a child that grows up in an environment that's created synthetically, that for which he's only fed certain kinds of images and doesn't get exposed to anything else in the world, then naturally you'll be able to recognize certain types of, of, of objects much better than other types of objects that you're less uh, exposed to. So, if you, if let's say I grew up in, in a place where I, I only saw Asians every, every day, which is true, because I grew up in Singapore, all, all I saw was, were, were Asian people. And so I'm able to tell all Asian people apart because my, my internal statistical learning algorithms are trained much more acutely to be able to tell one Asian person from another. But when I come to a different type of society and I'm thrown in here 20 years after growing up in, in that environment, then naturally I'm not able to differentiate other races as well as I, as I am the race that I'm, I, I'm more, I, I'm more uh, acutely tuned to. And so the same thing happens when you're dealing with algorithms that are trained to recognize faces and photos. When you have developers that are predominantly in one type of culture in one part of the world who are taking in one type of image from the sources they know and the language they know, then naturally the algorithms that they train and the systems they build will expose that bias and very publicly too. So cultural and societal biases seep into statistical learning algorithms at, very, at various points in the development process, and frankly, in very scary ways. The fix is very, very expensive. If you can see any kind of statistical learning algorithm that Google, Microsoft, um, or, or any, any large company ha have in place, they always have a report button over there. What, what does clicking a report button mean? Clicking one report button costs the, the organization tens of dollars, hundreds of dollars, because they have to spend human hours reviewing what this means. And every time someone clicks the report button, you need to spend time and effort to, to manually review what this means and whether you should fix it or not. And even when you know you should fix it, what does the fix mean? You know, when people talk about GDPR, they, they, they talk about how, how you can eliminate the, how you can el eliminate one individual from your training of your algorithm. And that's a big problem in itself because when you're training, when you're training algorithms based on the entire population of users in your platform, how can you remove the effects that one person has on the entire population of algorithms? And this is even a more nuanced problem because if your algorithm has some bias that has been trained, how do you trace the sources of this bias, of this bias within your initial training data set, and then how do you remove it from your algorithm? Do you collect maybe more samples that you can use to reduce this bias, or, or, or do you do it some other way? So the fix is really, really expensive, and I think how people have thought about the problem is that the earlier you fix the problem in the, in, in the process of training statistical learning algorithms, the better. So during, during sampling of data sets, when you, can, when you can remove the sampling bias and to have as large a population as possible in your initial training of the algorithm, then you're most of the time able to eliminate a lot of the algorithmic bias, a lot of the selection bias and classification bias and observational bias later on. 
The second case is, is really a, a little bit more nuanced because you're looking at targeted malice. When you're looking at algorithms that try to be resilient to attacker input, then it becomes really interesting because machine learning and statistics was never made, was never designed to be resilient to attacks. You know, when you're trying to classify a, an apple from an orange, you're not thinking about the apple constantly trying to look like an orange to prevent you from, from correctly classifying it. But in, in the sphere of security where the game theoretic concepts around classification really change and really change over time, then this becomes really interesting because all of the algorithms, all the research that's being done that all of ML is being built on today is, is built on the premise that your data set is static, nothing changes over time, and all you have to do is to feed in more data, and whatever the algorithm has learned in the past should still remain valid. But in most cases in security, in most cases in human behavior characterization, that is not true. And especially in this case, we're dealing with attackers that have every incentive to not be classified, to not be characterized by an algorithm, then they're gonna be changing a lot more quickly and they're gonna be doing a lot to avoid classification. So this is a quick illustration that, that, that we did about a couple of years ago when Google Translate was still taking in lots of, lo lots of different kind of input. We basically created some kind of DDoS system on Google Translate and we were able to make translations do the wrong thing. So whenever you uh, enter something into Google Translate, you can report a wrong translation and then you can suggest the correct translation. As you do that more and more, you start realizing that the translations eventually change to whatever you suggested. Right? Because if you, do, if you use an obscure enough phrase and, and then you have people that keep giving wrong translations and say that that's the right thing, then the algorithms will naturally try to learn from that. And so any kind of online learning system, online learning systems mean that they take in constant input from users, from end users who are looking at the, uh, at the predictions of these results and then trying to give feedback to the system and the system learns from this feedback. And so you realize that there are tons of different systems out there that are learning online, security systems being one of them because of the adaptive nature of how adaptive systems can learn to adapt to attacker traffic and changing, changing normal traffic patterns. This is an example that I have in my book. Anyone can build this with about 50 lines of Python code. You can have a classifier that works 100% well in classifying uh, web attacks from non-web attacks, and then you can input just 50 samples. 50 samples, you don't even have to use any kind of sophisticated DDoS techniques. Insert 50 samples into this online learning system, and then you can change the boundaries of your decision uh, factor such that you can input an attack that previously would have been detected as an attack, and now, after poisoning, would not. So I think there's lots of ways that we can think about bias. The framework that we think about it, this looks complicated, but really the purple or blue squares over there are the important things that they take note of. In the entire process of training a production machine learning system, we're looking at various different steps along the way, some of which are circular in nature. For example, when you first formulate and explain a problem, let's say I wanna train a machine learning problem to detect web attacks from normal human traffic then I want to be able to collect the data. I, I want to be able to define a methodology to collect samples that can be used to you know, train this algorithm. Right? Maybe there, it's on the HTTP layer, maybe it, it's, it's on a deeper layer. But the, the thing is that you have to think about data collection strategy and be able to audit it in a way that you would audit any kind of security policy or security process. Next thing is that you have to test for repeatability because none of the processes that you are using to train an algorithm six months ago would have the same kind of efficacy that you do today or a year later. So testing for repeatability over time is, is a really important concept and never allowing good results yesteryear to affect your confidence in the algorithm today. And then the most important thing is to have user studies and to have a feedback loop that enables your, your users to think about how they can report inaccuracies or how you can effectively monitor the results of inefficiencies or inaccuracies in a production ML system. And then when you're done with all of the, when you want to degrade such systems or deprecate such systems, the importance of graceful degradation and then, if, and then eventually dovetailing to the next system that you're building based on what you learn in this next system. So the trust model for AI is really this feedback loop. 
which is, which is kind of inundated into the whole concept of analog network security, where you have, where you have flip flops, when you have systems that take in input from various parts in your learning and system development process that goes into the training of your algorithm again and again, when you have a mechanism for reporting bias, when you have constant field studies, when you have constant evaluation of policies that are used for data collection, then you can think about how you can start measuring these biases over time and how eliminating a factor of bias can change your accuracy and then can change the number of reports you're getting, can change the number of, of uh, of data samples that you have to augment or decrease from a certain subset of your sample collection methodology. <coughs> Explainable AI is the yeah, interesting Yeah, we're, we're gonna get through this one. We don't have time to get through <laughs> this one right now. Um, how much should we trust it? I don't know. Uh, do you trust what the vendors say? I don't know, I'm suspicious. The real takeaway from here is that it is not deterministic. The processes and procedures in the last, latest round of RSA BS bingo is AI. And no offense, it's just part of the cycle of what we've been going through now since I've been doing this over almost 40 years. And it's the next round, and I'm not convinced that it's really going to be working. What is AI good for? Well, in my mind, okay, Google Translate, great. It's an approximation. It'll give you a good enough fuzzy answer to make sure you get a cheese instead of escargot, unless you want some escargot. There are things that it will work for, it will help for. When it comes to life and death, binary decisions, I don't believe in it right now. Do you, do you want to put your company's breach control policy under the test of AI and believe in it even though you don't know how it works? I would argue no. We need humans in the process to be able to ultimately make those decisions. Handing it over is roughly Terminator 1, Skynet, whatever term, war games you want to play, which were all early representations of the problems that we're facing today. These are the questions you need, you need to ask your AI vendors, regardless of what they're trying to do in their new latest product offerings. If they don't understand it, should you buy it? Should you implement it? Should you bet your company's security on it if they don't understand why there's an input and an output and over time it changes unpredictably? That is the state of the art. Any questions, comments? I know that we ran a little and wanted more Q&A, but we talk a lot, I'm sorry. And we will be outside if we get thrown out of here. Any questions at all? Uh, yes, sir, the AI vendor is going to take oh, issue God. with me. <laughs> no, I actually had a question for you. It's, um, curious on your thoughts of regulatory and government as far as their knowledge of when to determine bias. Government and knowledge in the same sentence. <laughs> we provide identity verification, and we have to prove that we didn't introduce bias in our machine learning algorithms. We think we can do it reasonably well. We have a model governance process. There's all types of banking regulators that ensure that there's not bias in our algorithms. Do we know how to, I mean, I don't know, and I, I'm going to defer to Clarence. Do we really know how, if we have zero bias, can we prove in a black box analysis that there is zero bias? I don't believe so based upon the research and math that I've done. Clarence. I don't, I don't think it's possible to quantify, to quantify in singular numbers what by, how much bias there is in the system. But if you have a test set, I think the common academic way to deal with bias is that you have a test set that is independently and separately come up with from your training data set and then you're running the algorithms and then having an independent panel to, to run reviews. One of the things that I, I do know that after my uh, Google uh, the, the deep thought thing, whatever that was, <laughs> Taking the same question or applying the same question to the same algorithm with the same data set produces different answers. So therefore, if you take a picture of whoever and you put it through the system a million times, the same picture, how is that going to change the bias in the output if the algorithm is non-variable? She wants me to stop. Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> If you put them in parallel, you're going to have a probabilistically, if you apply Bayesian probabilistics to it, you're going to lose. Uh, you want to do it with an AND gate afterwards, and I can give you all the math. It's in the book, believe it or not, 
how to actually do this. Uh, you don't want to do an OR gate, you want to do an AND gate at the end. Uh, but we'll be outside if you, anybody has any more questions. Uh, thank you very much. And I know I've probably pissed some people off. Sorry. <laughs>